Well, you're welcome again. This is, uh, I'm make sure it's, can you see it, Robin? Keep going. You might want to put it like around. next to the ah, That's good. I'll bring it back. Don't worry about too much. All right. So we've been, uh, we're going to continue in Romans today. We've been in Romans for the last um, eight chapters. We're going to jump ahead uh, quickly into Romans um, 5, 6, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to jump into uh, 9, 10, and 11. So we're going to try to cover three chapters in one day. So I'll have to be moving a little faster than normal. Josh, you'll have to just move the slides quicker. Um, you got it, Bob? Okay, good. So what we talked about uh, who is the authority in your life. Um, we talked about uh, people that we work with. Maybe you have a boss. Uh, you may have a good boss or a not so good boss. You may uh, have, you may have parents that you uh, that, that are godly parents that treat you in, in a godly way, or maybe not. Uh, you may have. Uh, uh, other relationships, teachers, coaches, people that you've grown up with that have had authority over whatever area in your life, and uh, those people quite surely have not loved you unconditionally like God has or treated you like God has. So we have to keep everything in context. We're going to try to do that today by talking about God's sovereign, sovereignty. So he's the one that sets the standard for, for authority in our lives. And so Paul has gone through this book of Romans, and the first three chapters or so, he describes our problem. And our problem is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we're, we're all, we've all made a mess together, and we're all in it together. There, there's none righteous, no, not one. So uh, God made a perfect place for us to be in a relationship with him, and we rejected God. So God's love continues to pursue us in such a way that he had to solve our problem for us because we couldn't solve it on our, in, in and of ourselves. We couldn't get right with God. The law we talked about was his way of showing us that we couldn't get right with God. And so our only solution was that Jesus came to the cross to die in our place to get us back into a right relationship with God by imparting his Holy Spirit within us. So that we are now in a right relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is sealed in us. So that is now our new identity. We are now uh, adopted children of God. So that solved the problem of sin by Jesus dying in our place. So that's kind of a, a, a catching us back up. So now Paul goes, okay, so so that's amazing and is you know beyond our comprehension. So by faith we have to believe this, and as we step out of this, now Paul has a problem, because Paul is Jewish, and Paul was one of the most learned, zealous Jewish people on earth. And so he was a keeper of the law, and he was a keeper of the law so much so that he was in charge of basically destroying the church and anybody that would follow Jesus. And, and until Jesus remembered the story in the massive thread where Jesus met Paul uh, and he, he came to a, a, a personal relationship with Jesus, then uh, all of this training in the law became worth nothing to him. He called it rubbish. And, and there's other words that we translate for that word that are more explicit. So he, all of his works and his religion and his knowledge and his ability to live up to the standard he called it really dumb. Um, so um, then what Paul did was he started to write these letters and help start churches and started helping then this new movement that was originally a Jewish sect that was still part of, the Romans thought it was still part of the Jewish religion, but really obviously Christianity had separated itself and, and delineated itself from okay, the law is no longer working for me, so I have to go to the cross. The cross takes care of my sins. Now God and I and you and God can have a relationship that is right again. So that's what righteousness is. That's what salvation is, being just as if you've never sinned, justified. We talked about Justin's name today, and what a great name that is. 
because it's just as if I've never sinned. God justified us. He made us back into, uh, put us back into a right relationship with him. So um, Paul's, Paul's problem is, is that coming out of Judaism and the early church was mostly made up of Jewish converts or believers in Jesus, they, they, were, they were struggling with the fact that they had had generations uh, of people that followed God with the law. So uh, it started with um, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, uh, Joseph, uh, Moses, uh, Joshua. Then it got into um, all the prophets and all the other old covenant stories and God's promises. So God made a bunch of promises in the Old Covenant to all the Jewish people that he would be their God. He, he, goes, he goes, I'm your God. Follow me and we're going to be good. Well, what happens is, is that he was looking forward to the cross. Remember, we talked about the credit card and the debit card. So uh, the Jewish law was really, and all the Jewish people that came before the cross were charging with a credit card against the cross. Jesus paid their bill on the cross, and then you and I are charging with a debit card because we have all the righteousness in Christ that we could ever spend. So our sins are covered forever, done away with, and so when we do sin, we, we, we just automatically that debit card swipe. So, so I'm just kind of setting up the, the picture, doing a little review here, because now in chapters 9, 10, 11, Paul is going to go, okay, I've got to, I've got to deal with the sovereignty and, and uh, God and his promises to the people of Israel. And because it, it kind of seems like they're getting left out here. It, it seems like this is, this is no longer an option here. The law is not an option anymore. It's all got to be through Jesus. And so some of the, obviously some of the Jewish people are going, that couldn't be right. God promised that we were going to be his chosen people. And, and so we could go into a lot of detail here, but let me just read at first what Paul says here in chapter 9. I am telling the truth in Christ that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my countrymen my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. God blessed forever. Amen. So here Paul's saying, okay, this is all true, but it, it creates a problem. Can you guys see the board okay back there? Or is this in the way? Okay. So this creates a problem for Paul with the Jewish people. The Gentiles didn't know anything about the promise, didn't know really anything about the law. They just said, wow, Jesus died for my sins. Okay, I'm in. That's, that's a no-brainer. I, mean, I, I get it. The Jewish people are sitting there going, okay, wait a second. What about what about all the things we've done and all the things our ancestors have done? What, what's going on here? And Paul's going, if you don't come in by faith, you're not coming in. And that's creating a problem for some of some of my family and friends and you know, for the whole nation of Israel. And they're questioning God's honor. Paul's, they're going, Paul, oh, why are you saying that God is not a promise keeper? And we know that's not true. We know God keeps his promises. So Paul says, you know, in order to avoid this problem, I would prefer that every Jewish man, woman, and child were saved through Jesus Christ by faith and were going to heaven. I would trade places with them. I would go to hell in their place. That's how much and how strong he felt about this, how much he loved Israel. And, and was concerned about this problem. There wasn't anything he could do about it. All he could do was turn and say, okay, I can't do anything about this, God. I'm going to continue to follow you, and I'm going to trust you that you are sovereign. You are in charge. You know what you're doing, and all I can do is follow you. I don't know what you're doing in regards to Israel. You've made these promises, and now it looks like you're not going to keep them. So I, I can't explain that. I don't get that, but I'm going to trust you. So in, in our lives, in our daily lives, there's things we can't explain. There's things that we don't understand about God. And in some way, we just have to walk those out each day. We have to trust God 
in our lives and the things in our lives that we don't like about our lives and the things that we don't think that are fair and, and things that don't make sense. We have to trust God with that. We have to give that all back to God who is sovereign. You know, it's, I did a sermon when Nathan was little. What was it called? Uh, Nathan in charge? So when Nathan was like three or two or something like that, he, one day we were saying something, Eric or I were talking to him and, and asked him to do something or he, he needed to do something. He goes, no, Nene in charge. And so so even as a three-year-old, you know, we all have this tendency to want to be in, in the chair, in the big guy's seat, right? We all want to be in charge. We all want to be on the throne of our own world and our own life. And so Paul's dealing with how to reconcile this problem with the Jewish people that said, God's made us a promise. He's, he's put us on the throne with him. We are his chosen people. And, and we'll see what Paul says here uh, in the coming chapters. God is, God is a loving God. God is a gracious God. God is a merciful God. He's a, a righteous God. God, he's a justice. He's a God of justice. And, and God is on his throne. So Paul has to, has to stay there. And, uh, the next few verses, God is just. So we're going to deal with this, Justin, right now. God is just. Um, so remember, we want a just judge. When you go before a judge, we don't want him taking favors. Like if you can pay the judge off, right? We don't want a judge that can be bought. We want a judge that's going to be fair. He's going to look at the law and say, this is what the law says. And, and here's, here's the charges, and I'm going to judge you fairly. We all want that judge to be fair in our lives. So we, we don't want a God that's wishy-washy or that can be influenced by one person or one, uh, you know, like somebody who gives a big donation to the church. Um, God's not going to give that person more favor than someone that doesn't give a donation to the church. Does that make sense? That's right. Right. We want a just God. So uh, the problem is... If, if we're over here, we're not living up to that justice. We can't meet that standard. The Jewish people had a problem. They, they weren't living up to the just standard of righteousness. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? Remember, Paul does the, uh, sets up his own arguments in, most, in a lot of his letters. Far from it. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy, and I will show compassion to whomever I show compassion. So God, in essence, is choosing who he's going to be in relationship with. And yet, that, that choice that God is making is based on his foreknowledge of who's going to receive him. So we could get into a big discussion on predestination versus you know uh, free will and free choice and that discussion will lead to you know an unending um, set of circumstances that can never be proven either way so we that we get to that point where we have to say okay god again you're in charge i'm not i don't understand it but by faith i receive you i know that you uh chose me uh, you, you called me, and you knew that I would respond to you, and, and uh, I had I feel like I had a choice in the process. So I don't understand how you predestined me and I chose at the same time. Those two things don't line up. Do, do you guys understand that? Because some of you that may not have been in these arguments before mm -hmm. with other people, because there are some people that really say, "Nope, God chooses whoever He wants," and you know. <coughs> Too bad for everyone else. And that that's not doesn't really sound like God. Or uh, God's really not in charge of who uh, he saves. We all are in charge of who gets saved. And that you know doesn't work either. So it's something going on there that I can't explain. The Bible doesn't clearly explain. No one else on earth can explain it. Only God can explain this. And we'll learn that. We see through a, a glass dimly now, but we'll see more clearly when face to face with God. So we do know that the penalty of sin is death. We do know that. And we know that the great reward of God's love is Jesus dying in our place. And we can choose that. And God knows whether we're going to choose it or not. How about that? We'll leave it there. So 
Um, God is in charge, and he's just. Uh, God is the potter. Uh, we, we've heard this verse a lot, but it's interesting how it starts to fit in here. Uh, the, the thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does the potter not have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one object for honorable use and another for common use? In other words, God is the potter and we are the clay. Does God not have the choice of what he's going to do with you and how he's going to make you? Isn't it God's choice? He created you. He, he's put... He put that unique personality, your mind, your will, and your emotions, your personality is unique to you. There, there's no other like you. God, God thought uh, before time about you and, and had you on his heart and created you specifically and, and special for his purpose. Whatever God's purpose is for you, he's, he's had that in mind for eternity. So there's something special about you because God has taken you and chosen you and formed you. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't love all the other people that are not choosing him. It's just that there's some relationship between God and you now through the cross that a lot of people are attempting to get on their own strength of the law. And Paul is dealing with this. Some things work out um, the way we had hoped in the process of our lives, uh, but all things work together for good for those that are love God and those that are called according to His purpose. That doesn't mean our lives are all going to work out just right. Some of us will face hardships uh, that other, others of us won't face. We'll all face some sort of um, um, hardships in this world. There, there's going to always be something that's going to confront us in this world. We talk a lot about a few weeks ago about how the enemy confronts us, especially when we become, uh, the Holy Spirit becomes alive in us, then the enemy takes note of those that are God's agents in this dark and fallen world that needs his life, his love. And so <coughs> the enemy starts to work. The Holy Spirit can block the enemy. But if the enemy uh, is left, watch out, watch out, buddy. if the enemy is left, um, to his own devices, then the enemy can start to get into our mind, our will, and our emotions and create problems for us. So if God is the potter, he, he can do what he wants with us. But because he loves us, even after he has saved us uh, through his son and put his Holy Spirit in us, we still can choose to be in this relationship with God in Christ. So through the Holy Spirit, through the cross, through the Holy Spirit, somehow we are seated in Christ in the heavenly places. So it looks like all you guys are seated in this room. So physically you are seated in this room in this world. But spiritually, in the spiritual domain, you are seated in Christ, through the cross, the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and seated in Christ in the heavens. So there's two things going on here simultaneously. We're dealing with this world from an eternal perspective, and we forget this is really where we are and where we'll always be. And in the meantime, all this go, all that's going on right here is, is God molding us. He is the potter. We are the clay. Our circumstances aren't always what we would choose them to be. Sometimes we have to have medical uh, issues. Sometimes we have to go through relational issues. Sometimes we have uh, you know, to get another job or to uh, hope that the judge is favorable, right? Sometimes we pray for that in, in circumstances in our lives. We, we come to places where it's out of our control and we're trusting God with the results. And um, that happens to all of us differently. Now, where we run into the issue is where we want to tell the potter, it says right here, why did you make me like this? Why did you put me into this circumstance? So what happens is the enemy goes, the enemy tries to do an end run here 
gets into our minds, and we want to get on our little throne right here. And we want to be, we want to be Nene in charge, or whatever your little baby name was, in charge. Because this is, this is, these are our, a lot of the grace, the grace people that you know want us to focus strictly on this. We're all right here. No, actually, we're here and here. One day we will all be here that, that have chosen God. But in the meantime, we're in here dealing with this world. We got this world, you know, sending us messages about what we look like, what, what we feel like, uh, how we're making choices. Are we choosing to let the Spirit move through us? Or are we choosing to be in charge of our own little kingdom? Do we like the circumstances in our lives? right now, or do we choose to be in control of our own lives and, and ignore the reality of who we truly are and where we truly are? Yes, you've been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, but you can pretend like you're still in charge. Um, it's interesting, too. I, I think Jesus uh, displayed that um, Pretty vividly, when um, when he was going to the cross, did, did Jesus? I mean, just want to go to the cross? No. What did he say? He prayed. Yeah, hey, let's let's you know, can't wait to get to the cross. Did he say that? No. Yeah, so in, in his, in, he was here. With, he was one of us. He was. He had all this stuff going on here. He had a earthly body, right? He had his own mind, a will, and, and emotions. He, he felt. He cried. He. He, uh, you know, he chose not to sin. He was tempted like all of us. And he still had to choose. But he could have chosen to do whatever he wanted to. He could have chosen uh, when, the, when the enemy came to Jesus, he could have chosen to, uh, to, 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 to take the deal. The enemy offered, the devil offered Jesus a deal three times. Remember when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights? The enemy was offering him a deal. Jesus is right here with us in this in this world. He has been here. He's walked in our steps. He was like little Nene, but he never said, I'm in charge. He always said, the Father's in charge. My Heavenly Father's in charge. So, God, you got God, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and these, the Godhead is, is all one. I mean, there, but there's, there's, it's three in one. So that's again something else I can't explain. So I'm bringing up all sorts of subjects that I can't explain. All I can do is by faith tell you that the Son listened to the Father, and He said, "I'm sending the Holy Spirit," and they all work together. They all have unique personalities. They're all, they, they're all, they all have. They're, they're this. They're, they're basically people in a sense. Like us, the Father is like a person. The Son is like a person. The Holy Spirit is like a person. <coughs> not, not like us, but but somehow we're going to be uh, in their image. Uh, and when Jesus comes into our Holy Spirit, we're going to see how all this is fitting together. We can't see that now. The Potter is molding the clay. All we have to do now is choose whether we're going to put God on the throne of our lives, he saved us, but is he on the throne of your life? He saved you, but are you trying to be in charge? Are you letting all this misinformation, and this is what is really misinformation, put you in charge of your life? Maybe, there's, maybe someone's uh, saying or doing things to you at work that you don't like. And you don't you don't like this boss at work, and you're you're not you're going to basically just disregard his authority and do your own thing. How long are you going to stay in that job? The Bible tells us to respect the authorities in our lives. I, as I was preparing for this, I, I had to pray for our our president, our government. I had to pray for the people that are in charge of our country. That that not necessarily that you know that I think. People that get power start to try to rule over people, but they are our authority. We have elected them in positions of authority. So it's our job, whether we agree with them or not, to pray with them. 
pray with them from our position in Christ. Uh, not to not to sit here in our own devices and, and try to run our world from our own little throne. Who's who's where are you? Are you seated in Christ in the heavenlies in God's throne? Are you, are you on your little throne? Like the clay saying, why did you let this happen to me? Why is this person like this and, and, and keep keeping my life um, uncomfortable for me? Why are these situations like this? Why do I have to go through these circumstances that I'm going through? I, I, God couldn't be a good God because I'm having to deal with things that are uncomfortable for me. And, and Paul's dealing with this using the law in Israel, who is now questioning God and his sanity because he's saying that the law is no longer going to save you. Only, only through the cross can you be saved. So God is a stumbling block in that regard to those that do not follow him. But why? Because they do not pursue it in faith, but as though they could do it by works. They stumbled over the stumbling block. Just as it is written, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion of a stumbling block, a rock of offense. The cross is offensive to the law. The cross is offensive to the world. The cross is foolishness to those that don't believe. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The law has its purpose. The law is holy. The law is just. The law reveals basically the truths about God, but the law is useless when it comes to righteousness, being right with God. Only Jesus can get you right with God. And if you don't like it, you can go sit on your little throne and pout. That's your only other option. So the good news, well, and Paul rehashes this, and these are great verses that we use all the time. You will be saved by faith. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in our heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, disregard all this misinformation, confess in your mouth, believe in your heart. Remember we talked about the Holy Spirit and our, our personalities become our heart. Believe in there, that deepest part of you, um, uh, which will result in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses result in salvation. Uh, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen and amen. So by faith, Paul reiterates this as he's trying to justify why the cross is the only way. And so if you do make this, uh, if you do make this decision, then you have to make a secondary decision in your daily lives. Will you allow God to mold you the way he wants to mold you? Will you allow God to put you into circumstances that are uncomfortable for you? and still honor him and still be like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit one. I think he uses marriage uh, as a picture, an earthly picture with a husband and wife. Um, and there's a oneness there. there there's, there's, there's a oneness that doesn't separate. He calls it one flesh. Becoming one flesh. And there's all sorts of uh, ways that the husband and wife represents the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to a fallen world that doesn't understand this. They can see it in a marriage. It's, it's hard for someone to pick up on all of this. It's hard for someone to realize that God's three in one, three persons in one God. But they can see it in a marriage. Um, there's distinct roles. The Father has a distinct role. The Son, the Son only did what the Father said. The Holy Spirit was sent by the Son to be the Son's hands and feet. They all have distinct roles. There's not one that is greater than the other, but they all have uh, a role to play. And in a marriage, there's not one 
uh, husband or wife more important than the other, but they all have distinct roles to play. And, and if, the, if the roles get out of whack here, then there's chaos in the marriage and then in the family and then, and then other relationships. So you have, you have children here that are all looking at this marriage and then there's other relationships, then there's maybe another marriage starting to form here, and they're looking at this relationship to see what this marriage is gonna look like. And not, none of this in this earthly situation is gonna be perfect, like this is gonna be perfect. But at some point, somebody's gotta say, I'm not in charge. God's in charge. God's in charge of my marriage. God's in charge of uh, my my work. God's in charge of my health. God's in charge of the days that I have to live. God's in charge of the circumstances that I face every day. God's in charge. I'm not. And I'm gonna I'm gonna love and live like God loves and lives. Because He's in charge and He's trustworthy. His promises are true. And, and I'm going to bow to him. I'm not going to get in my, my little throne and path. I'm going to bow to him. Now, does that mean we do that all the time? Sometimes we call him back up on that, do Sometimes we just get tired, worn out, and frustrated, and call back up on our little throne. And that just leads to chaos and a mess. You can see that, you can see it kind of in relationships easily. Uh, James says the, the arguments among us are just examples of pride um, coming out. That's just one or both of uh, two people are climbing up on their little thrones. Um, but the good news is, is that we'll be all sent. We're all being sent. Because we, God, God has a purpose. He's not done with us. But, but others need to know this. And they're going to know this through your marriages. They're going to know this through your just your basic relationships and how you treat other people at work, what you do for other people, where you go with other people, um, how you respond. Um, you may not all be preachers, but it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. This is the only thing that's good in this world. And all of us that know him bring that news. You bring that news. You can't bring that news if you're up here pouting on your little throne, can you? That, that news gets kind of blocked, right? So the good news, on top of the good news, is that God's supporting us in this process. He is, he is going to, he is grafting us in. I'm not going to spend much more time on this because we just got too much information. Um, but going back here, he, he's rejected the people that rejected him. He loves them. He wants them to come in. But it talk, he uses the illustration of the olive branches and the olive tree. And he's breaking off the olive branches and the, and the olive tree that, that don't come to the cross. And he's grafting us in. I don't know if you're horticulturist, but you can be grafted in. That's how they get different different fruits and flowers and trees is by grafting in uh, one tree with another or one species of a tree and plant with another. So God has grafted us, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, into the family of God. And so we, we, he knew that he was going to do that. We, we chose him. We told him we wanted him to do that, and he did that. Now, the olive branches that he Cut, broke off, I think he still would say, you can be grafted back in if you want to. He's, I think he still gives them a choice. But uh, he's, his promises are true because the option for Israel is still the cross. So that's a whole other discussion. So God is sovereign. Uh, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? 
or who has first given to him that it would be paid back to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. Amen. To him be the glory forever. Amen. 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 Come on, guys.